So um, I'm going to talk at you. I apologize in advance. I'm going to talk at you for about 30 minutes or so about what I sort of see as happening in education technology in recent years. Um, and um, as Daniel said, you know, oftentimes I think we fixate on the, the tech part of education technology. And what I want to argue is that we need to start looking a lot deeper, a lot more critically at some of the things that aren't necessarily the products or the tools to really be able to see the, the ways in which certain forces um, in industry, certain forces in society, certain political forces imagine the future of education, um, education to be. And as Daniel said, every year since 2010, I've undertaken what's really an insane massive project in which I look really closely at what's happened in the twel previous 12 months um, of education news and technology news in order to write a series of articles that I call the, the top ed tech trends. And this is how I spend my November and December um, researching, writing. The project usually turns out to be about um, 75,000 words, which I didn't realize until someone pressed print is about 240 pages. Uh, we have to read these at 240 things during oh. <laughs> So I do that every year. Uh, yeah. Um, so all these words and all these pages, they make it a very, very different undertaking than most year in review stories that you find on the web, particularly much of the Happy New Year clickbait, right, where you're supposed to, these stories that offer like the top 10 or six or three things in a bulleted list um, that are new enough or, or cool enough to hype with, you know, the headlines, right? These are the six trends that are going to change education forever. These are the five tools that are going to revolutionize how students learn. Um, to be honest, those are the headlines that sort of in some ways inspire me to continue to, to do this project. Um, even, though, even though each year when I'm about 15,000 words in, I do ask myself, why, why am I doing this? Um, so hopefully this talk will remind me, um, it'll explain to you a little bit what I think about, but it'll remind me why maybe, maybe it's important, maybe not. So last year in November, before I launched into this madness, I gave a lecture at the um, Virginia Commonwealth University titled, The Best Way to Predict the Future is to Issue a Press Release. And you can read the transcript on my website. It's just it was sort of one articulation of really what's a recurring theme in my work, and that is, like I said, that we need to be much more critical about the stories we tell and the stories that we're told about the future of education. Indeed, I think we need to look at the histories of the future and ask why certain people have wanted the future to take a certain shape, right? and why certain technologies and those stories have been so compelling. And so to be clear, when I write my trends series, it's not meant to be predictive. I'm not trying to predict the future. Rather, it's, it's a history, right? It's one that I hope is useful for thinking about the past and the present um, and the future in the way in which the study of history always should be. It's a look back over what happened in the course of the year um, I've, um, you know, to uh, the course of each year, not simply to counter a phrase that I'm going to invoke from um, the only hockey player I can cite, uh, Wayne Gretzky's dad. Sorry, Canadian friends in the audience. Um, to skate where the puck is going, right? But rather, I want to think about where the where the puck has been, right? And more importantly, for all of us working in education and to think about the people who are issuing press releases and where they <coughs> want the puck to be, right? Where they want the future to head. So I'm not here to tell you, um, based on my analysis of ed tech trends, what tools you should buy, right? Or what tools you should incorporate into your teaching or what old tools you should discard. Um, that's not my role, I'm not an advocate not a salesperson, I'm not an evangelist for ed tech. And this always makes a few people in the audience really angry. And they, they like to tweet afterwards, she didn't tell us what we should do. 
Yeah, um, I'm not going to tell you what you should do. Uh, the uh, other common one, she didn't develop a fully fleshed out 3,000 word plan to fix education forever. Also probably not on the agenda in this talk. <laughs> um, it's not actually the point of my work. I'm not a consultant hired here to sell you a particular path forward or how to implement your next project, <coughs> although I do have a lot of ideas about the domain stuff. Um, my work is not market research in the way in which market research typically functions, right? Um, according to the press releases that you hear all the time, markets are always growing. Ed tech markets are always growing, going to sell billions of fill in the blank, right? Sales are always increasing and the tech is always amazing. I want us to be more critical about all of these claims about the politics, really, and not just the politics. So the next time that you're faced with consultants or you're faced with salespeople, we can all do a better job of sort of challenging their, challenging their claims and, and questioning their advice. So these are just a quick look at the things that I've selected over the past um, the past years that I've done this project. Year one, I only chose five. Sorry, my bad. Um, US politics, online learning, mobile learning, social learning, social networks, investment in education technology. Early on, I recognized that this was probably something that was worth thinking about a lot more critically. Ed Tech um, in 2011, that happened. The iPad, it revolutionized education forever, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, social media, text messaging became a really big thing in the States. Um, people started talking a lot more about data, but really what they meant in the US in particular was just standardized testing. The digital library, um, Saul Khan got a chunk of change from Bill Gates. He became a thing. Um, Barack Obama talked about STEM education having a Sputnik moment. My arch nemesis, Peter Thiel, um, who now advises our president, who's, whose name I can't quite say, <laughs> um, <laughs> argued that we were facing a higher education bubble and students shouldn't go to college. And he offered, famously offered, students who were under 21 because you know, once after you're 21, you're sort of a washed up intellectual has been. Students who are under 21, $100,000 to drop out of school, mostly men. Uh, um, open, this notion of open and then the business of ed tech. 2012, oh, 2012 was the year of the MOOC, right? 2012, the business of ed tech, the maker movement, learning to code, we can start to see in which Silicon Valley was really starting to shape some of the conversations about th that the purpose of education technology is sort of the tech to create more technologists. The flipped classroom, MOOCs, of course, um, open textbooks, education data gets kind of reframed as learning analytics, building platforms. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, automation and artificial intelligence I thought was interesting, partially because of the founders of the MOOC startups were all artificial intelligent intelligence professors and politics. 2013, zombie ideas, this idea that like every year these ideas come back from the dead. Like we think we've killed the VLE and we've convinced everyone that like maybe it's not a great idea and we could do something else. And then inevitably it rises from the dead, the sort of monstrosity that we never seem to get rid of. Um, there's lots of zombie ideas in ed tech. Politics, standards, MOOCs, um, and then already by 2013, people were kind of sick of MOOCs. The anti-MOOCs, coding, um, hardware, data, the battle for open. What counts for credit started to be talked about more and more in the states, in particular badging and this invest investors. Um, buzzwords, investors. Thinking about school as skills, MOOCs, which became clear that were less about massively open online courses and a way another third party vendor for universities to sign on with. Competencies, Common Core, which is a standards in the US, data, the indie web. And you could tell around 2014, this was when I was like, this is so depressing. I have to fi find a couple of like 
places of joy and resistance to the sort of onslaught of, of corporate ideas, um, the indie web, social justice. And then there were a lot of stories in 2014 of just massive ed tech failures. 2015, much of the same, actually. It, it doesn't seem to change much. Um, employability, talking about credentials. In the US in particular, the for-profit higher education um, became under, came under increasing onslaught from the Obama administration. Of course, when you have a president that runs something called, Tr a scam called Trump University, for-profit educa higher education in the US is really stoked about how the election went down. <laughs> the MOOC, data, a lot of campus activism, and social media, indie ed tech, business of ed tech. And then last year's trends, wishful thinking. This idea that we hear a lot of technologies get hyped again, that, that these are gonna revolutionize and transform education forever. And last year seemed to be a year of, of magical thinking and wishful thinking. Um, magical thinking and wishful thinking around the way in which certain elections in my country and in, in this country went. Um, but also magical thinking uh, about uh, the future of technology. Um, again, the same things, the new economy in particular, um, personalization, data insecurity, and this idea of, of inequality permeating, permeating what we do. It, and so as you can see, like a lot of what I write about aren't technologies at all, but rather about the ideologies that are deeply embedded in them. And I, I want us to think about I technologies as practices, right? Political practices, pedagogical practices, not simply tools, right? Practices that some tools might enable and that some tools might foreclose. You know, and throughout the year, I follow the money, really. I follow the money, I follow the press releases, I read the headlines, I listen to the stories, I try to verify the claims that I hear from marketers, from salespeople, from politicians. I look for patterns in the promises that people make about what technologies will do to education, what they'll do for education. And then it's based on these patterns that I, I pick my, my top ed tech trends. And they're not trends, obviously. They're themes, they're, they're categories, they're narratives. I'm, I'm really interested in, in narratives. And admittedly, I confess, because of my methods, because of my location, um, they're quite US-centric, so I, I apologize. Um, and even more specifically, I'd say they're very California-centric. Centri um, I do live in California. Um, they're very Silicon Valley-centric. Thankfully, I don't live in Silicon Valley. I live in Hollywood. Uh, no, I don't live in Hollywood. I live near Hollywood. Well, it's LA, so it's near, but it's like five hour drive. <laughs> okay. So I use the phrase like Silicon Valley a lot in my work as a shorthand to help us think about and understand the way in which the contemporary high tech industry works. Again, it's tech, but just as importantly, the political economy, just as importantly, it's ideology. And sticklers about geography and I don't know if there are any in the audience today, often like to say that Silicon Valley isn't actually the most accurate geographical description for where today's booming high-tech sector is located. Um, if you say Silicon Valley, it ignores what happens in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is, of course, the site of Harvard and MIT, who like to remind you all the time that nothing in education happens without them sanctioning it. Much like I think that the Oxbridge model does here, right? You can't sneeze without someone from Oxford saying, yeah, that was us, we did it first, and better. Right. Um, we say Silicon Valley ignores what happens in Seattle, the home of Amazon, um, Microsoft, and of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the influence of Bill Gates in education and education technology really cannot be overstated. He's not part of Silicon Valley per se, um, perhaps not cool enough to live in California, um, but the anti-democratic bend of his philanthropic efforts, right, 
justified through this claim of genius, right? He gets to be this, this genius. Um, this idea that you can substitute charity and tax get some tax relief for justice is absolutely part of, I think, what I call the Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley narrative. I think Bill Gates spends most of his education funds on screwing up the education school system in the US <laughs> and then his global healthcare funds on screwing up healthcare in the rest of the world. So I'm not sure here in the UK if you experience either of those. I hope not. I it things are rough enough without Bill Gates stepping in. You know, Silicon Valley is just one part of Northern California, one part of the San Francisco Bay Area, Santa Clara Valley, Santa Clara C Valley's county seat, and the locus of Silicon Valley, historically at least, is San Jose. And not San Francisco or Oakland, where many of the tech startups today increasingly are located. Silicon Valley does include Mountain View. That's where Google has its headquarters. It has includes Cupertino. That's where Apple is located. It includes Palo Alto, home to Stanford University, um, founded in 1885 by a railroad tycoon crook, Leland Stanford. Some things never change. The Silicon Valley in the Silicon in Silicon Valley refers to the silicon-based integrated circuits, right, that were first developed and manufactured in that area. Um, but I. I like to extend it to incorporate the whole high tech industry, not just chip makers. And those chip makers, of course, aren't located in Silicon Valley anymore. Right, the rent's too high. Um, arguably, you could say that the phrase Silicon Valley obscures the international scope of the tech industry, right? Tax havens in Ireland, manufacturing in China. Um, but if the scope is international, the, fl the flavor, I think, remains distinctly Californian. Right? There's something about California as an idea in a lot of the technologies that are now adopted globally. This belief in the reinvention of the self, that you can be anyone you want online. California as the dream factory. It's a... This it's a idea that involves a certain optimism for science and technology, that, that these are going to be the penultimate solutions for all of today's problems. California is a belief in utopia, right, in technological utopia, a belief in the freedom of Internet technologies, that in the Internet as freedom this is profoundly Californian. This is there is also an advocacy in California, in the West in particular, for libertarian politics. Again, think of Peter Thiel, who went to Stanford, no doubt, and who now advises number 45, as some of us like to call him, uh, resentfully, with revile our mouths each time. <laughs> 